This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, Dildo is getting ready for more late night appearances on Jimmy Kimmel Live as the talk show host continues his pitch to become the mayor of Dildo. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. Leaving the premier is getting in on the dildo talk show action. Ball tweeted directly to Kimmel, officially inviting the talk show host to come for a visit. Ball says this province would give him a break from the heat and the traffic in Los Angeles. And Ball promised Kimmel would fall in love with the province. And then this afternoon, Kimmel sent out a tongue-in-cheek response. He says his sidekick, Guillermo, is on the ground in Newfoundland. And then he wrote that the Kimmel family looks forward to seeing the balls. Yes, he loves his double entendres for sure. Our Adam Walsh is in dildo tonight. So, Adam, any sign of Guillermo yet? Well, Carolyn, not yet. We're still waiting around to see, but everyone's eyes are peeled for Guillermo, and that's what everyone's talking about, too. They're wondering where he is, when he's going to arrive. And as we are coming in here, if you can look at the sign just behind me, Jimmy loves dildo, Kimmel for mayor. These signs are peppered all over dildo. It's a real carnival type of an atmosphere here because, you know, I know it's summer and people come here to enjoy the summer fun in dildo anyways, but man, oh man, this place is on wheels today. People are going by, having a gawk at stuff, and they're just having a, a great time. You look around, people are wearing t-shirts for Jimmy Kimmel, and they're just excited about this show. It's really kind of amped the place up. A little earlier, I was watching them test some lines for the show with one of the producers. They're keeping their cards close to their chest, but well, we'll see what happens. We'll see what comes on the show tonight and throughout the week, because everyone really also, in addition to Guillermo, they want Jimmy Kimmel to come here too. So we'll wait and see. And as, as far as this goes for Jimmy for mayor, look, I've covered a few political campaigns and I haven't seen one so one-sided before. So we will, uh, I think he's got a pretty good shot. Reporting live from here now, I'm Adam Walsh in Dildo. Well, in other news tonight, a legal fight between Nalcor and Astaldi gives another glimpse into the troubles the Italian contractor is facing. Documents filed at Supreme Court in St. John's show Astaldi owes a big bill. Astaldi was contracted to do most of the construction at the site in Labrador. When they began running out of money last fall, they were kicked off the job. A judge ordered both sides to go to arbitration, but that process has not gone well for the contractor. Astaldi lost a key battle during arbitration and was ordered to pay $437,000 to the Muskrat Falls Corporation. Now the deadline has come and gone without paying up, and the corporation is now taking a Staldi back to court. They'll have a hearing on August 22nd in St. John's. Well, after months of proceedings, millions of documents, and over 100 witnesses, lawyers at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry are putting their final uh, summations to the commissioner. The hearings are scheduled to take place all this week in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and that's where Jacob Barker is right now. So, Jacob, what happened today? Well, uh, Commissioner LeBlanc heard from several of the different lawyers representing the different parties, and you could tell early on it wasn't going to be an early, uh, an easy ride for these lawyers. Just hear how he challenged the lawyer for the government of Newfoundland and Labrador. Yeah. I did ask questions during the inquiry that certainly went to the issue of oversight, and for instance, information that went to the province's public servants. And yet, at this stage, you're telling me that you want to, you don't want to answer a general question with regards to has the crown got an interest in the way the government expends money? I'm, I'm having trouble reconciling that. Well, that's fine, but I'd suggest it's because of your misunderstanding of the role of the crown. Okay. It's not I don't because, think I misunderstand. Not because the role it's of not crown. because of. I mean, we have had the same. Well, no, we didn't get it perfect all the way through. I'd suggest that that's. There's times, perhaps, when you know, uh, we, we we didn't get it perfectly right, but. We have tried, as, as Crown, as Her Majesty, to contribute to this inquiry in the best way that we knew how, and it was, it was challenging. Now, it isn't the Commission's responsibility to determine a criminal or civil liability for the project, but lawyer Jeff Budden for the uh, Concerned Citizens Coalition, um, he, uh, he said that the Commissioner could weigh in on the conduct of project leaders. At, in one form or another, 
in their actions or inactions that they, uh, they are guilty of a form of misconduct. We've made certain recommendations to that effect or certain comments in our brief. And uh, beyond that, the two individuals who we reluctantly felt it necessary to identify were Mr. Martin and Mr. Harrington. Now, the day ended with a submission from the lawyer for former CEO Ed Martin, and that will continue tomorrow morning. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. The indigenous population in St. John's is the fastest growing in the country. That's according to the Premier. Today, the federal government announced new funding to reflect that. Here are now's Katie Breen reports. I am pleased to announce on, on behalf of the Government of Canada that we will be investing more than $3 million in the First Light Headquarters relocation project. I think we're gonna there was space at the back of the room for the announcement today. Something First Light, formerly the St. John's Native Friendship Center, is about to get some more of. In the last eight, nine years in particular, our main building on 716 Water Street just does not give us the capacity that we need to administer and to implement our programs and services. Well, it's a work in progress. After a meeting in St. John's, there's no new deal on who will pay for new wastewater facilities required by the federal government by 2020. The mayors of St. John's, Paradise and Mount Pearl met with federal ministers Seamus O'Regan and Francois-Philippe Champagne at City Hall in St. John's. New federal regulations require more wastewater treatment than this Riverhead facility provides. New infrastructure to further clean the water is expected to cost more than $250 million. The federal government says it will pay 43% of the cost, but the mayors say it should pay 50%. As you know, traditionally the federal government has come in infrastructure projects for, for decades at one third, one third, one third. Now, uh, we understood uh, when we came in government that the fiscal capacity of different parts of the country and different municipalities uh, could not sustain that model. So that's why we went beyond uh, that commitment. In this case, we're well beyond the one-third. We had a great discussion. We had some uh, some ideas that w that went around. Minister Champagne's committed to coming back to us on a couple of issues that, uh, that we asked for further information on. And we have some ideas that we have to go back and look uh, look at and discuss with uh, internally and with our uh, our partners at the provincial government. And uh, then we'll uh, we'll be able to see if we uh, have a way forward. Well, a large section of a busy street in downtown St. John's remains closed today and will stay that way for the rest of the week. The pavement and ground underneath Prescott Street collapsed Saturday afternoon during a brief but powerful rainstorm. The heavy pressure of the water caused an underground storm sewer in the area to collapse, creating a sinkhole. Crews are expected to have it repaired and the road reopened by Friday at noon. Well, the Atlantic Rock under-19 rugby team is the new national champion. The Rock won the Canadian Rugby Championship on Saturday here at home. They beat the defending champions, the Ontario Blues. The final score was 21-5 for the Atlantic Rock. It's the first time in nine years that the team has won the title. There's no shortage of Jimmy Kimmel excitement in Dildo. I will talk about that and have all about it coming up on Here and Now.
Mm -hmm. All right, so Ashley is still off today, so I'm going to walk you through the weather forecast, starting with a look at the highs today. It was a gorgeous day in St. John's. Lots of sunshine, a bit breezy, a high of 22 degrees. Warmer as you go inland, about 24 degrees uh, in Badger today and cooler in Labrador, 12 degrees in Nain today. So right now things are pretty quiet on the island not a lot of precipitation but we do have some on the way moving up from the maritimes overnight tonight so you can see some patchy showers for labrador tonight uh, some heavy downpours expected there and a chance of some thunder showers for the happy valley goose bay area on the island not too much happening you can see a few showers moving in overnight for the buren peninsula there overnight lows on the island between 13 and 16 degrees mostly a cloudy evening Evening coming for St. John's and those winds staying fairly high overnight. Southwesterly 30 gusting to 50 and a few light showers for the West Coast. So for Labrador and Happy Valley Goose Bay, you can see that risk of thunder showers there. About five millimeters of rain expected overnight tonight and two to four in Nain. So looking ahead to tomorrow, showers continue for Labrador and you can see we have this band of showers that's pushing up from south to the northeast coast throughout the day. Some heavier showers in Corner Brook around three o'clock is when we're looking at it moving in to the Buren Peninsula area and continuing throughout the day for the coast of Labrador as well. Here's a closer look just to see uh, in all of these kind of orangey yellow patches there are there is a risk of thunder showers uh, happening there. Those are the heaviest downpours throughout the day and uh, you can see here four o'clock that's when it's going to hit the Buren and then the Avalon will be seeing that later on in the evening. So about five to ten millimeters of rain expected for the Bonavista area as well as for Marystown. Temperatures a little bit on the cooler side there, 18 degrees along the coast, but a balmy 24 degrees expected for St. John's. Those winds staying fairly high throughout the day as well. Lots of rain as we move into central areas, uh, 5 to 10 millimeters for Terra Nova, Gander, 5 millimeters for the Grand Falls, Windsor area, and Harbor Breton looking at a good shot of rain as well. Same story for the west coast, 5 millimeters along uh, the coast there for the Port of Basque area, 5 as well for the Gross Morn area. And temperatures just below 20, so a little bit on the cooler side than what we've been used to lately. And chance of showers throughout the day for the Straits, 21 degrees in St. Anthony with some very light winds tomorrow. And uh, for the rest of Labrador, looking at 13 degrees for the Churchill Falls area so on the cool side for sure Happy Valley Goose Bay, Bay looking at some more rain throughout the day and a chance of showers for the Nain area so uh, as we move into Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. That's when the Avalon Peninsula is going to start seeing some of those heavier uh, downpours. Shouldn't last too long though. Then we get into Wednesday morning. Things are clearing up a bit. It's still a few showers there on the west coast, but a mix of sun and cloud largely for the rest of the island as well for Labrador there. So 15 degrees as the high in Lab City on Wednesday, as well as for Happy Valley Goose Bay for the island. Not a bad day shaping up a few little showers as I mentioned on the west coast, but temperatures looking quite nice. 21 degrees in St. John's, 23 in Gander there. So as for your long range forecast, things are looking all right actually. On Thursday, mostly cloud cover for the east, 18 degrees as the high, and then we get into this nice mix of sun and cloud as we head into the weekend and temperatures hovering around the 20 degree mark. For central areas, things are a bit warmer there, but a nice stretch of sun and cloud coming for central and for the west coast, a few showers there on Thursday, and then they get also get into that uh, trend of sun and cloud heading into the weekend and temperature around the 20 degree mark. For Labrador, though a stretch of showers there and temperatures dipping down on Thursday to 15 degrees but looks like it could come up again as we get into the weekend and a similar story for uh, western Labrador some showers there 13 degrees as the high on Thursday and 20 degrees on Saturday. All right, so let's head back to Dildo now, where our Adam Walsh is tonight. Uh, the town is in the spotlight after appearing last week on Jimmy Kimmel Live. And Adam, it really seems like that area is on wheels. Oh, it is on wheels big time, Carolyn. And wait a minute. Do you ever feel like you're kind of like the odd person out when you come <laughs> to an event? Everyone's dressed up and ready to go here, except for me but I'll have to remedy that a little bit later. I'm going to bring some people into the conversation because I'm surrounded by a bunch of people, but let's start with you, Karen. Karen McDonald, you're a local business owner, and you're also 
I guess, Hollywood North for this evening. So uh, tell me a little bit about what's on the go with the show and how it's affected your business. The business like is a big booming now for the business and tonight we will be live on Jimmy Kimmel again in Dildo for the Dildo Cove Coffee in Craft. So what's it been like with all this excitement? It's very exciting and I am too and all the town of Dildo is very exciting to just say welcome Jimmy Kimmel to be a mayor in Dildo. Awesome. Now I'm going to shift over this way to Andrew Pretty. You're with the town. Yes. What are Jimmy's chances of becoming mayor? <laughs> well, we're, we're only a local service uh, district community, so uh, we don't have a mayor. We're not a municipality, but uh, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure we can do something for Jimmy if he, if he runs a good campaign. Well, that won't stop Hollywood. <laughs> no, it won't stop Hollywood, that's for sure. So listen, what's it been like since, it's been a whirlwind, right? So what, what's it been like for you with it, everything going on here with Jimmy Kimmel and I guess just as they turn up the volume and the heat of this attention from the show? Well, the community has been a buzz all week and I've never seen as many cars go over this road. And I, I joked to someone today, I said, we're gonna to have to put another lane in pretty soon because it's just, traffic is just black, blocked right up. People taking pictures of the signs around and people stealing the signs <laughs> from, the, from the lawns and everything. Sorry so about that. It's just crazy. <laughs> yeah, so and then uh, I guess there's just going to be, you keep going with it, riding the wave for as long as it uh, lasts. Well, we're riding the wave and, and I, I, I like to keep things respectable because we are a very proud town. We, we don't want our town to be too, too, um, too much for the brunt of jokes and innuendos. And, but I think the producers realize that. I think they see the beauty here, the, the friendliness of the people, the businesses here that, that are uh, so uh, willing to, to open the doors for the tourists that frequent the town just because of the name. Great. Thank you very much. No problem. We'll have more about tourism and what it means for the local area coming up on Here and Now. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Adam Walsh in Dildo. Oh, wow. Free cod because fishermen say the processors don't want it. Fish harvesters protest on the St. John's waterfront.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Fish NL is fighting for its life. For the second time in three years, the group is trying to get certified as a union to represent inshore fishermen. In order to do that, they need 4,000 harvesters to back them. Here are now Cease Hair reports. All it takes is a signature, 4,000 actually. Fish NL says it needs 4,000 signed cards by November the 8th to go along with its application for certification with the province's Labor Relations Board. If all this sounds familiar, here's why. About a year ago, the board rejected Fish NL's application to become a certified union. Back then, the group had about 2,300 membership cards signed. Now they need nearly double that. But Cleary says this time is different. We know the rules of the game. We know where the goalposts are. We have the definition of an inshore harvester. Anybody with, the, with a fish sale in their name in 2018 or 2019 with dues remitted to the FFAW, they're good to sign a fish and L card. We also have more time. Last time we had six weeks. It was just before Christmas. This time we have three months. The Labor Relations Board will only accept cards signed within the 90 days before the day the application is filed. 4,000 signed cards would trigger a vote for inshore fishermen to decide which union they want, Fish NL or the FFAW. Union organizing has been Cleary's goal for the last three years, and he maintains inshore harvesters will be better off with their own union. One single union cannot represent all sides in the fishing industry. Inshore harvesters, fish plant workers, workers on offshore factory freezer trawlers, aquaculture workers, workers on oil tankers, workers on seismic boats, brewery workers, hotel workers, metal fabrication workers, all under one FFAW umbrella. Cleary says the membership drive will go on the road in two weeks. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Well, still with the fishery, in a rare move, the provincial government will allow outside processors to buy cod from harvesters in Newfoundland and Labrador. Minister Jerry Byrne says it's in response to a call from the FFAW, the union representing most fish workers in the province. Now, the union says local processors are refusing to buy their cod. Before Byrne's announcement this morning, some harvesters were giving away cod at the St. John's waterfront. So the Northern Cod Stewardship Fishery opened yesterday um, and late last week FFAW received word from the Association of Seafood Producers that some of the larger processing companies in the province would not be buying uh, Northern Cod this week. So many harvesters have been you know, gearing up for the fishery for a few weeks um, and many were out setting gear yesterday. So they have cod, uh, they have no buyer for it um, and so in response to this we're giving it away for free to the general public here in St. John's. We're also holding a demonstration outside the Royal Greenland plant um, in Old Perlican today to try to send a strong message to those larger companies that uh, we need them to collaborate to work with harvesters and to be purchasing this good quality uh, fresh codfish. What was the reason given by uh, processors that they wouldn't be buying cod right now? So, so we haven't had a very clear reasons uh, for not buying it. One that we assume is around uh, a quality of fish. Um, certainly the very, it's a very good quality fish that's landed this time of year. Harvesters have taken um, steps over the past number of years to introduce new protocol when they're fishing to ensure they're landing a quality fish. Of course, the cod is abundant right now. Um, and for people in a smaller boat, this is the best time for them uh, to be going fishing. They can't wait until later on in the season. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're landing good quality cod today and we, we don't have buyers so this is the last resort uh -huh. and uh, so what will harvesters do now this week well, we've called on uh, the Provincial Minister of Fisheries and Agriculture, Jerry Byrne, to uh, intervene in the matter. Um, the uh, lockout is how we're seeing this, um, is a violation of the Fishing Industry Collective Bargaining Act, which prohibits uh, strikes and lockouts um, in the fishery. So we're asking him to intervene and we're asking him to issue uh, new processing licenses and open up the fishery to outside buyers. So we're hoping that there are some uh, processing companies outside the province who are willing to buy this cod if the companies within the province aren't. Okay. 
Are you worried about the precedent that that would set though for the future? Well, I think allowing the larger companies to dictate how the fishery is prosecuted is a, a dangerous precedent to be setting. You know, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans sets the opening dates for the fishery. They do that in consultation with harvesters and with processing companies. Um, the companies were well aware that the fishery would be opening this week. If they had issues with that in the past, they could have made them known, um, but they did not. So now to shut harvesters out when they have fresh fish that they want to sell, uh, we think that is a much more dangerous precedent to be setting to allowing to allow these larger companies to kind of dictate what we're doing in the fishery. Heard on the news this morning they were giving away free fresh, fresh cod, but um, I also wanted to come down and show my support for our Newfoundland fishermen. They're often uh, accepting uh, Russian cod in our plants, meanwhile our Newfoundland fishermen, uh, they won't take their cod. It's a travesty and uh, it's terrible that uh, our Newfoundland fishermen uh, are not able to sell their product. So uh, luckily we came down, we got ourselves a nice big fresh cod, a nice big fresh cod on the pan tonight. Well, I saw the article on Facebook, and uh, I think it's absolutely scandalous that they can't accept local fish. And uh, I thought I'd pop down to see if there was any petition or anything like that, and then they said free fish. So um, this is what I'm trying to uh, come down and offer my support somehow. No. Uh, were you familiar with the issue before you saw that? No, post? never before, no. It was just I came across it by accident, and uh, basically I was quite enraged because where we come from in England, we're a fishing town, and uh, we hold that very dear to us as well. So, uh, you know, we're just trying to help our comrades, really. Now let's return to a story from earlier in the show. We had a technical glitch when we brought you a report about new funding for indigenous groups in St. John's. Here now is that report from Katie Breen. I am pleased to announce on, on behalf of the government of Canada that we will be investing more than $3 million in the First Light Headquarters relocation project. I think we're there was space at the back of the room for the announcement today. Something First Light, formerly the St. John's Native Friendship Centre, is about to get some more of. In the last eight, nine years in particular, our main building on 716 Water Street just does not give us the capacity that we need to administer and to implement our programs and services. This building is going to help. There's no for sale sign out front, but First Light says a deal is in the works. The plan is to renovate and turn it into the organization's new headquarters, move people into their own offices instead of having them share with two and three others. It'll be a space for community-oriented Indigenous programs and general admin work. According to the interim executive director, this building out back is also being looked at for further expansion. This is more than a project. This is a community coming together. This is about this and future generation so that the heritage of Indigenous uh, people in Newfoundland and Labrador can be uh, put in display so that we can favor indigenous art, we can favor indigenous culture. And with that, I think it's part of the reconciliation agenda. This space, Cochrane Street United Church, is part of the expansion too. First Light provides a ton of different services. There's programming around cultural identity, around adjusting to urban life. It's shelter for some people, daycare for others. Some arts programs already take place here, but with the funding announced today, this building will become an Indigenous Creative Arts and Performance Center, except for Sunday mornings, when it reverts back to a regular church. First Light's executive director says it'll probably take about a year and a half or two years before First Light leaves its current headquarters and heads over to Caledonia Place, that first church. But he says once that move does happen, it'll leave more room here for expanded housing services. Katie Breen, CBC News, St. John's. Well, I personally feel that it shouldn't be changed because it, it was good enough for people before, right? So I think it's good enough for us now. What's in a name? 34 years ago, there was a petition to rename Dildo. We'll look back at that campaign, plus some other famous name changes.
Welcome back. Well, as we've heard throughout the show, there's an international spotlight on Dildo this week. Late night talk show host Jimmy Kimmel has discovered the town and its unique name and jokes that he wants to run for mayor. Now he sent his sidekick there to check things out. Earlier today, the production team was rehearsing for tonight's taping of Jimmy Kimmel Live. Our Adam Walsh is also in Dildo. So Adam, what has been the impact of all of this attention? So the big question here is, what does this all mean for the business community? So we've got Colleen Morrissey here and Todd Warren. So what does this mean for the business community? It's bringing international rec recognition to our community. It's uh, like all over the world. So like my bookings have increased like maybe 40%. So, and it's, it's highlighting the community of Dildo. It's bringing lots of people to the communities, which means more money coming into the community so to help everybody so i mean it's, with tourism it's feast or famine for four months so this is absolutely fabulous and we're all riding that bus and uh, we're having a great time doing it so it's already peak summer season but for your inn which is just down the road yeah. it's it's already it's given you a 40 percent bump oh my god yes yeah. normally it will be slowing down probably now uh because they say after we get a day, then that's it. Mm -hmm. Winter hits. <laughs> yeah, it's, so, yeah, winter, yeah, it's all over, So right? basically what we're doing is uh, we're getting more and more bookings, and I'm booked now probably right up till October. All right, Todd, let me bring you into this. Sure. Uh, look, at, once, once this Jimmy Kimmel wave is done, what do you think? Like, how do you, can you capitalize off of this? Well, we can, yes, because there's an opportunity for other uh, people that want to go into tourism business in the area to open up some other little ideas that they might have of their own to benefit uh, to help our community grow hmm. and then uh, what's your plan now for tonight and like i guess with everything else going on here just having a good time or what oh, yeah, of course of course of course like colleen said we're just riding the wave of uh, of, of, of mr campbell's uh, tribute to our little community and we uh, reap the rewards off it and uh, hopefully it will be a fun ride for everyone Thanks. I like your hat. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's it for me. Reporting live for here now from Dildo, Adam Walsh. Well, with all the excitement around the community of Dildo this summer, we thought we'd take you back to a summer nearly 30 years ago, and that's when some residents began circulating a petition to change the name. That happened after several other areas in the province had changed their names. Here's the CBC's Ann Budgel from 1985. Looking around the island, there's dozens of examples. Roddickton used to be Easter Brook. Campbellton was formerly Indian Arm. And Cavendish was Shoal Bay. But there were other changes made because the people were embarrassed by the name given their community generations ago. For example, in 1913, the people of Cuckold's Cove, Trinity Bay, changed the name to Dunfield. They were embarrassed because the word cuckold refers to a man who is deceived by his wife. A few months ago, the people of Gayside, Notre Dame Bay, decided their community's name was embarrassing. Even the town's mayor admitted the old name didn't fit in 1985. Like a, and I've been in places myself, Larry, where I refuse to tell the people where I'm from. I would say maybe from Lewisport or from Birchie Bay. And if I say Gayside, people will look at me queer. Today, Gayside is called Baytona, a name that's neither embarrassing nor descriptive nor historical. Meanwhile, over in Trinity Bay, the gay side issue prompted one resident to ponder. If gay side is embarrassing, what about dildo? I was after winter and my foot broke for two months and I was just lying around and it came up with gay side, right? It was on the news at the time. So the idea struck me. I wonder how do people feel, uh, around here feel about uh, living in dildo? So Alford made up a petition and carried it around town. He's got quite a few names now and figures he'll have a majority before long. But some people say they're signing the petition even though the name Dildo is not an issue with them. I signed, yeah, against my better judgment probably, but I did sign. Why? I don't know, uh, other than uh, for the younger, younger people, young kids moving out uh, you know, in, into other parts of the, the country. Other than that, I, I, I'd prefer to see it as it is. What is the problem? And although the adults say they're doing it for the youngsters, well, uh, this young fellow has thought about it and he's not bothered. Well, I personally feel that it shouldn't be changed because it, it was good enough for people before, right? So I think it's good enough for us now. 
The community name is a subject of great interest to Lloyd George, a lifelong resident. He's thought about how the name originated, and although there's no positive explanation, he thinks the name is too good to change. To me, Dello is, is uh, so, so good that I, I wouldn't even consider changing it myself. None, uh, you know, for instance, can you imagine people in St. John's changing their name because there were John's on the market years ago, people use John's? Can you imagine people living in other parts of the states in Canada, living in condom minions? So they're associated with condoms, so why, they're not going to change condom minions. Even if the name of this community is changed, the word dildo won't disappear from the map. Nearby, there's South Dildo, and there's also Dildo Pond and Dildo Run. Ann Budgel, CBC News. Well, now to Nova Scotia, where a family's dream came true last year when they won a beautiful home in a fundraising lottery for Halifax Hospital. But now they may have to sell it. The CBC's Jack Julian tells us why. They call it a dream cottage for a reason. You couldn't ask for a sweeter view. And Troy Fahey still seems a little overawed, remembering when his fiancé's ticket hit big. The, the two of us were, were like that high off the ground the whole drive up. It was just, it was so crazy, right? They call it a cottage, but it's really a luxury seaside home with a view of Chester Basin, south of Halifax. It came fully furnished and ready to go. Basically, they took every idea that we ever thought of, ever dreamt, and they put it in this place. But Fahey and his family aren't ready to move in quite yet. He works as an industrial cleaner in Halifax. His fiancée is a roofer, and the kids are still in school. He wants to move here in five or six years' time. We came up with the idea, put it on Airbnb. The money from that will help pay the taxes, and you know if there's any upkeep or anything like that, plus the other bills that come in with it, your power and whatnot. Fahey says his guests love the place, but they don't feel all that welcome in the neighborhood. The old stink eye, like they'll wave to certain neighbors and they'll just put their nose up in the air and walk away. At $400 per night, it's not the vibe he was hoping for. And I feel really bad because they're coming from all over the world. I mean, we got them from Texas, from Scotland. We just had a, um, some guests leave from the Middle East. So they're putting a lot of money in to come up here and relax and have a great time and then be kind of shunned and treated like they're not wanted. He says some residents have even complained to his guests directly. You know, somebody showed up here and told them they had to be in bed by 11 o'clock and none of the neighbors wanted to be here, like wanted an Airbnb here. Fahey's problems have moved beyond angry neighbors. In two weeks, the Neighborhood Association will hold a vote on banning short-term rentals. Fahey says that could spell the end of his dreams of a seaside retirement. We would have to penny, penny pension. We wouldn't have much of a life, right? It's just every, every ounce of money that we'd have, we'd have to put it off to the side so that we can keep this place. Fahey's neighbors wouldn't talk to CBC about their Airbnb concerns. The developer also declined to comment. Jack Julian, CBC News, Chester Basin. An autopsy has concluded the two bodies found in northern Manitoba last week are those of Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski. The Manitoba medical examiner says both teens died of suicide by gunfire. Police say two firearms were found at the scene. A forensic analysis is underway to determine if the weapons are linked to the three deaths in British Columbia. McLeod and Schmigelski were suspected of murdering three people in BC last month before fleeing eastward and disappearing into the wilderness. They were charged with second degree murder in the death of UBC botanist Leonard Dick and are also believed to have killed Australian Lucas Fowler and his American girlfriend, China Deese. Investigations into those deaths are still underway. Well, now to news south of the border, his apparent suicide has already launched widespread concerns, questions, even conspiracy theories. Now the death of Jeffrey Epstein is also triggering multiple investigations. They very wealth, the very wealthy and well-connected financier was found dead in a New York City jail early Saturday morning while being held on federal sex trafficking and conspiracy charges. Ellen Morrow has the latest developments. Attorney General William Barr spoke out angrily today on the death of accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein, who died in an apparent suicide at a Manhattan jail over the weekend. We are now learning of serious irregularities at this facility 
that are deeply concerning and demand a thorough investigation. The FBI and the Office of Inspector General are doing just that. U.S. media outlets are reporting serious lapses in how Epstein was monitored by guards. Lapses that occurred even though Epstein, a high-profile inmate with past links to powerful people like Donald Trump and Prince Andrew, apparently attempted suicide less than two weeks ago. Two guards were supposed to check on Epstein every 30 minutes, protocol that reportedly wasn't followed the night he died. The guards responsible for him were also reportedly working what's been described as extreme overtime. Epstein's death came the day after thousands of court documents were unsealed for the first time. Documents revealing new details about the trafficking accusations and how Epstein allegedly helped prominent men have sex with underage women. Epstein's alleged victims and lawmakers are demanding answers on how he was apparently able to take his own life given the wide scope of the accusations and that he had already shown himself to be a suicide risk. Today, the Attorney General promised justice. Let me assure you that this case will continue on against anyone who was complicit with Epstein. The victims deserve justice and they will get it. The prime suspected co-conspirator is Ghislaine Maxwell. Epstein's accusers say she was his girlfriend and his madam, allegedly helping him create a sex trafficking operation that allowed Epstein to have sex with up to three underage girls a day. Epstein was worth some $500 million when he died. His alleged victims will be able to sue his estate for damages. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. The people of Manitoba are about to get a chance to pass political judgment on their progressive conservative government. There's a provincial election coming on September 10th. Premier Brian Pallister called a snap election today and he began the campaign by taking direct aim at his primary opponent, the NDP. Manitobans know that we inherited a mess, a big mess, an NDP mess. Emergency room wait times were the longest in the country with no prospect of getting shorter. Taxes were among the highest in the country with no intention of getting them lower. And our finances were the worst in the country with no plan to fix them faster. We inherited an NDP mess from a government that deliberately hid their record of reckless spending. The SPENDP gave us higher taxes, unsustainable spending commitments, special deals for union bosses, and a deficit that would top a billion dollars if nothing was done, and they covered it up. He said, I want it, I want it. And I'm saying, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he sold the first Ford Mustang ever built right here in St. John's. Now Harry Phillips is about to be reunited with that classic car.
welcome back. A retired St. John's car salesman is getting the opportunity of a lifetime. In 1964, Harry Phillips sold the first Ford Mustang ever made. Now he's going to be reunited with that iconic car at the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan. Harry spoke with Here and Now's Meg Roberts. Put me back on that day that you sold the car. How did that all go down? Well, we had the car on display on Elizabeth Avenue on the roadside, and the fellow that bought it, Stanley Tucker, uh, he, he got odd with it right away. He said, I want it, I want it. And I'm saying, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but he couldn't take delivery of it for about two weeks. So he couldn't take it, he couldn't drive it, he couldn't do anything with it. Only he used to come in all the time and check on it and make sure nobody got at it or nobody dented it and, and uh, he just loved it. So at the Wheels for Wishes show about three weeks ago, I think, um, the NL Mustangs president, I believe, Scott Halliday, sort of put out to the crowd, we think that we should try to push this forward and if anyone has interest to take this on, we would really like to reunite. We created a Facebook page, um, a Twitter account, and an Instagram um, with Send Harry to Henry. And within 24 hours, it had about 10,000 views on the Facebook page at least. Um, people were sharing, people were sending or um, like liking it and all that kind of stuff. And it just sort of caught on. And then people were c connecting with us and talking with us and asking us questions. And it sort of evolved to you know what it is here today. On that day that you sold it, did you know that you were making history in a way? No, 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 not a clue, no. We weren't aware of it. The serial number really didn't mean nothing then. It's, it was just there until we really started observing, well, 100,000 and one, now, what does that mean, you know? And uh, we weren't aware of it for quite a while that it was the first one. I think it's going to be super emotional. Um, even when we were up there today, you could tell that he was getting like a little bit choked up about it. Uh, so I think it's going to be a very like surreal, very emotional moment for him, something that he will never forget. And I would love to be there with him when he sees it. Standing in the museum, the Henry Ford Museum, looking at that car, what will that say? Oh, that's, that's going to be fantastic. I just can't believe it. I can't believe it until I'm there <laughs> and see it. Yeah. Full circle. <laughs> Full circle, yeah, yeah, after 55 years, yeah. Well, we have another car story for you. Over the years, a lot of people have dipped their toes in the Atlantic Ocean, either at the beginning or the end of a cross-country journey. But have you ever seen someone dip their tires? Harvey Soicher drove his electric car from British Columbia to St. John's. The trip took 41 days and he did it in honor of his wife, Marianne. She had always wanted to visit Newfoundland, but passed away before she got the chance. Soicher says it cost him just $240 to charge the vehicle along the way. He says the trip proves that it's possible for anyone to make the switch to an electric vehicle. Yeah, the proof is here, yeah. I didn't have any incidents. I had one close call, but other than that, it was great. Before I set out, I, I took, uh, there's an app called PlugShare, and it identifies exactly where all the charging stations are. And once you uh, know where they are, and you, you figure out the distances between the charging and make sure that there was enough range in my vehicle to be able to do it, and uh, it was definitely doable. Well, mindfulness is a topic that's on many minds these days, from meditation apps to spots created to help you zen out. The relaxation trend is booming and businesses are stepping in. Talia Ritchie reports. Taking a deep breath and a slow step. Along Toronto's waterfront, a group embarks on a reflective experience combining music, spoken word and nature. Very simple but powerful when we connect our steps with our breath and take in the landscape, how slowing down and realizing that we're not walking to get from point A to point B anymore, we're just moving to be in the present moment. Being present seems like a state many are seeking out these days. Hundreds signed up for Mind Travel's first hike in the city, a guided walk with wireless headphones. 
It's easy to spend hours staring into your phone and it's not easy to sit for hours and stare at the water anymore, which is crazy. <laughs> so I want to get back to doing more of that too. Well, I think people more than ever are looking for ways to find more meaning, to find more calmness. And that's just one of the ways that people are trying to achieve mindfulness. They're also lying in float tanks and they're downloading apps and they're even doing yoga with puppies and goats. At Soul 7 in Yorkville, the idea is that your brain needs to stay fit just like your body. From here, we would uh, give you headphones that are just to your right. These NeuroFit pods aim to help people relax and recharge. Through guided visualization, sound frequency therapy, and personal mastery coaching. So in a 45 minute session, a deep state of relaxation and mindful meditation is achieved. And beyond the businesses, one psychiatrist says there's also been clinical studies looking at the benefits of this practice. Mindfulness might be incorporated in terms of cancer care, helping people with that illness cope better. Mindfulness certainly is a, a red hot area when you talk about depression and preventing depression relapses. Uh, Mindfulness is also something that people sometimes use when they are trying to reduce stress. Dr. Gratzer says that perhaps the fact that we're talking more about mental health could be contributing to the rise of these businesses and experiences. But he also wants to remind people that before they break the bank on relaxing, it's best to see a family doctor if they do have symptoms of mood or anxiety disorders. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, here's a strange question for you. Would you ever lie on a mattress on top of an active beehive? Well, that's the latest health trend that has some people buzzing. This treatment center in Lithuania specializes in bee 
therapy. It claims the unusual procedure can soothe pain and heal ailments because of the energy created by the bees flapping wings. These claims are not scientifically proven. But that doesn't stop hundreds of clients from swarming the facility each summer. Well, that wraps up uh, this Monday edition of Here and Now. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.